is Alexandria French and I will be giving a presentation in response to a Security Council simulation as a representative of the state of Belgium. I hope you enjoy and thanks for listening. I will be following the agenda set on this slide. After a brief introduction that restates the facts, implications, and appositeness for the international community, I will start establishing the foundation of my policy proposal. Cardinally, I will review specific historical events similar to the topic that pertain to the whole of the international community on one hand and the state of Belgium on the other. Further, I will detail the significance behind analyzing the framework of historic events and the momentous impact they have in regards to formally executing critical decisions. Then I will provide more context as to the background and relevancy of Belgium by detailing its unique interest in international relations, as well as their consanguinity towards the issue. More specifically, this will include Belgium's potential involvement, its interests at stakes, and the relative influence it will have on the United Nations Security Council. Next, I will review three possible council options, namely choices and consequences, distract and attack, and choke and isolate. Their specific agendas and tasks, as well as their potential benefits and deficiencies. With recourse to these policy options, I will provide the State of Belgium's formal policy proposal for the crisis. First, the logic and rationale behind Belgium's preferred strategy will be divorced into four categories, cognizance, adherence, principality, and humaneness. Second, I will implement Belgium's interests in accordance with these doctrines before transitioning into the relevant international rules and regulations, the legality of the policy proposal, and finally, the practicality of its application. The presentation will conclude with a geopolitical forecast and final recommendations. References are listed at the end of the slideshow, but they are also linked below in the description box. Negotiations concerning North Korea's nuclear weapons program have ultimately failed on behalf of the United States of America. As a result, North Korea has taken up an aggressive stance against the U.S., Japan, South Korea, and other nations with similar interests. The cost has been the loss of military lives, mass panic, displacement of refugees, and the possibility of nuclear warfare. Ultimately, the relentless and macabre political and military actions of North Korea prove that the state is not only a dangerous and reckless rogue actor, but one that will not hesitate to act without respect to international regulations or basic humanitarianism. The following proposal highlights the necessary actions the United Nations Security Council must consider in order to respond properly to the crisis. If the UN Security Council does not act accordingly and with caution, the likelihood of an intense and potent attack by North Korea is inevitable. We will outline three potential avenues of requital before arguing for the most promising course of action. Belgium's ideal choice, referred to as choke and isolate, allows all interests to coalesce and is the most likely to succeed because it not only offers an avenue for more peaceful relations, but an opportunity to intervene in North Korea's ongoing humanitarian crisis. This avenue will be discussed in detail in the latter half of this policy apparatus. Unfortunately, the deterioration in both state cooperation and international relations has led to threaten, quote, massive military retaliation by North Korea if any perceived military action is directed towards the North. Already an attack against Japanese ships, which were patrolling North Korea's EEZ between Japan and the Korean Peninsula, has led to the destruction of three Japanese vessels and the death of 56 Japanese sailors. North Korea claims that this attack was conducted in an act of necessity and in, quote, preemptive self-defense because they presumed the Japanese were conducting espionage. However, the Japanese were only found to be engaging in a routine patrol. Because the attack was more preventive than it was preemptive, it is clear that the action was illegal under the regulations found in common international law. The situation has further escalated after the responding U.S. 3rd Naval Fleet was targeted by unmarked vessels near the territory of Guam. The attacking ships were subsequently destroyed, and one one case detained, by a U.S. and Australian Joint Patrol. The ship's crew, apprehended by the Australian Navy, wore unmarked military uniforms. Despite admitting to being natural citizens of North Korea, the sailors vehemently denied any union between their own actions and the interest of their government. They have requested to speak with their consular officials at the North Korean Embassy in Jakarta, Indonesia, for legal aid. The head of the state himself, Kim Jong-un, has also denied involvement with the unmarked vessels, stating that the ships were not sent on behalf of North Korea. 
Though the missiles failed to strike the third fleet, they were found to contain chemical warheads containing the nerve agent sarin. As a result, panic and chaos has risen in major Japanese cities such as Seoul and Tokyo. Each city is currently gridlocked as innumerable people have attempted to flee by highway or airway, encumbering all means of travel but escape on foot. Belgium's seat on the United Nations Security Council has been driven this year by our country's commitment to conflict prevention and the respect for human rights, therefore preventing the developing humanitarian crisis, which is driving people away from their homes and creating an insatiable need for water, food, and supplies, in addition to a nuclear strike, currently occupies our state's first priority. The federal state of Belgium is directly affected, as many other western states, by the actions and promises of North Korea. As a party to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO, Belgium will act in accordance with the interest of the United States, a fellow treaty member, and the state of Japan, with whom NATO has ardent connections. NATO's special class of partners, also known as contact countries, exist throughout the Asia-Pacific and include Japan as well as South Korea. These contact countries hold comparable strategic interest and in policies that align with alliance standards. Their continued integrity has led to a formal assurance by NATO that promises that its alliance, quote, will be open to consultation with any partner country on security issues of common concern. We will give our operational partners a structural role in shaping strategy and decisions on NATO-led missions to which they contribute. Further, Japan is informally considered the 16th member of NATO, which triggers a de facto response to the illegal attack against its military vessels and personnel. While members are not required to engage, they must review their interests, especially because the Alliance's main role in East Asia is maintaining the balance of military power through obviation. Historic events are an important resource that, when respected, grant a state the capacity to understand past mistakes, which sets a positive precedent for future endeavors. In order to restabilize international peace and security, we must utilize this comprehensive knowledge. For instance, we know North Korea's behavioral patterns to do its repetitive actions, providing that the state is culpable to react with emotion before sense. What's more, we also know that a hands-off approach will be the most effective because the current regime leader can assume something as meager as common dialogue as a form of attack or aggression. Therefore, until we decide on a collective action, it is wise not to poke the proverbial bear. The international community first experienced similar tensions as the threat of nuclear warfare loomed in the geopolitical arena during the Cold War. The war was the most unconventional conflict of the 20th century and developed out of philosophical differences between the Soviet Union and the United States. Totalitarianism and democracy struggled against one another to gain the most influence in an attempt to isolate its opponent. We can draw from this experience that if we seek to understand the philosophical ideas that define a regime, we can understand their conduct and determine their future behaviors. Additionally, successful policies will possess complex, advanced statecraft that adapts principled actions to reflect ongoing circumstances, rather than relying on traditional norms. This adaptability ultimately led the U.S. to a Cold War victory while the Soviet Union collapsed. However, this is not to say that touchstone principles should be tossed aside. These concepts define the core of any institution, including the United Nations, and cannot be compromised for strategy. Only a few days prior to the Nuclear Security Summit, Brussels was attacked by an Islamic group, which raised concerns that jihadists had the potential to locate U.S. nuclear weapons stashed in Belgium. Fear of nuclear terrorism in Brussels became a primary issue, especially when it was found that the weapons had not been properly secured. The attack truly highlighted the intense level of responsibility a state holds when handling nuclear warheads. Belgium was and is part of a burden-sharing program with NATO that began during the Cold War and the U.S. had nuclear weapons, or GIFs, located at Klein Brogel Air Base in the province of Limburg. The most important lesson was that the nuclear weapons were not an aid, but a burden. However, this does not mean that states should not properly care for such armaments, but that when a state does not possess enough responsibility or cares too heavy a burden, it will neglect or mishandle the weapons. Regardless, a state must be willing to accept this burden, and Belgium has attempted to approve a motion for the withdrawal of nuclear weapons from its territory in light of the incident. 
We have learned from our mistakes and have proved that even an advanced westernized state can be irresponsible, even if indirectly, in certain circumstances. North Korea is an irresponsible state, and we are unsure of how many nuclear warheads the state possesses, and this on top of their ballistic missiles, chemical weapons, and biological elements. Similar to the Cold War, however, the best deterrent to a nuclear weapon is the potential of mutual destruction. NATO, therefore, should keep the gifts from the U.S. in order to deter attacks on Europe. In 2018, NATO formally reaffirmed this concept, stating that, quote, the fundamental purpose of NATO nuclear forces is deterrence, and that as long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance, end quote. The world must improve nuclear material security and not rely solely on the method of deterrence. Belgium has made numerous statements prior to the escalation that began in the new year and has even called on North Korea to relinquish its weapons of mass destruction in an absolute and irreversible matter. Yet, the UN Security Council neglected to act in upholding its resolutions, which has directly affected the European region as a whole. To trouble matters further, regional security and stability are perilously close to upending in the region as social and political turbulence wreak havoc on European governments and society. Thus, we are terribly vulnerable to any outside turbulent forces, especially aggressive, targeting regimes. As a European pillar for NATO and a state who values ourselves in expanding greater regional cooperation and multilateralism, Belgium is frustrated that the European cry in March was left unanswered. Further, our state is a strong advocate for transitional justice and fundamental human rights. North Korea's aversion towards prioritizing its illegal weapons of mass destruction rather than attempting to cooperate with the proper institutions directly violates our revered principles as well as the United Nations. During our Security Council presidency, we said that, quote, regional cooperation is an important vehicle for defending common and shared positions. Conflict presumption and respect for human rights are the driving forces behind our country's commitment to the Security Council. While no policy proposal will be universally accepted or wholly foolproofed, a course for action is not only necessary but vital. Therefore, the UN Security Council must act with respect for international laws and concurrently maintain an ability to adapt, alongside accepting the responsibility of answering for unforeseen changes or consequences. The agreed-upon strategy must be more resilient than the state of North Korea itself, yet malleable enough that its purpose does not expire or become irrelevant or after its formal publication and before appropriate actions can be initiated. Additionally, the policy procedure must possess the capability to encompass an expanded capacity should new challenges confront the already serious strife. The policy commitment under conduct and consequences requires the UN to respond to North Korea with proportionate measures by Japan and its allies through acts of self-defense and action in the defense of others, which is a guaranteed right under the UN Charter. North Korea may retreat upon the realization that the UN Security Council will not hesitate to respond to threats to its member states that disrupt the peace and uphold international legal standards. Some benefits of this deal is that it is very malleable if it is effective, and it may deter North Korea from future attacks, though it is not guaranteed, and it is time efficient. The deficiencies of this proposal start with that this can absolutely further destabilize North Korea. It can also cause them to get more aggravated and it does not redu reduce or neutralize the threat. There is also a high probability of war, no long-term solution for either the aggression or humanitarian aid. And this is also a very temporary resolution to a problem that needs a lasting resolution. The next policy option offers to distract North Korea in order to draw its focus away from the attack that will be proportionate to its perceived, now immediate, threat on Western countries and their allies in Asia. This would raise the threshold significantly higher than the original amount allotted for the state of Japan and the U.S. while engaging in the distraction, whether it be a provoked arm attack or a decoy missile launch, invade North Korea in order to infiltrate and destroy their weapon systems and manufactories. If possible, retrieve Kim Jong-un and release him into ICC custody. 
A few possible benefits of this proposal include lessening North Korea's military capabilities quite significantly. It might neutralize the threat if successful. It would also potentially deter North Korea better than the first option, and it offers a semi-permanent solution. Some drawbacks, however, is that this can further destabilize North Korea, and just as the first one, it may lead to war. There's no guarantee of success. Um, it will not be a long-term solution, and it does not have a route for humanitarian aid. This option is also not very malleable, and it does pose quite a significant financial risk if anything goes airy. The most plausible option includes UN member states holding bank accounts associated with North Korea in order to freeze their assets. Those states that possess working North Koreans must suspend their bank activities, put them under a suspension, and detain those suspicious of filtering money through to the regime. Western states and their allies in Asia should launch non-nuclear missiles to destroy the nuclear facilities, weapon manufacturers, and missile launching systems. Once these institutions are fully inoperable, establish both land and naval blockades. Recommend Kim Jong-un and his deep state loyal government officials for crimes against humanity and war crimes to the ICC. Assets will remain frozen and traveling North Korean citizens under their respective foreign government's careful watch until the successful capture, relinquish, or surrender of these officials. A few possible benefits of this proposal include lessening North Korea's military capabilities quite significantly. It might neutralize the threat if successful. It would also potentially deter North Korea better than the first option and it offers a semi-permanent solution. Some drawbacks, however, is that this can further destabilize North Korea, and just as the first one, it may lead to war, there's no guarantee of success. Um, it will not be a long-term solution, and it does not have a route for humanitarian aid. This option is also not very malleable, and it does pose quite a significant financial risk if anything goes airy. The logic and rationality behind this approach is based off of prior knowledge and an immediate need for change of course. The policy provided is cognizant in that it forces an active adjustment to unconventional UN methods. Those actions will be proportionate and legally sound and will reflect the ongoing circumstances. Lastly, it prioritizes the obligation of the UN to maintain a stable peace in terms of international relations rather than simply accusing a nation without providing a sound solution for the main issue. It also is adherent because it engages the UN to act against a state in discord with its resolutions and mandates, thereby actively enforcing international law through multi-state cooperation. Again, it adheres to the principle of proportionality and the right to self-defense, thereby satisfying the necessary legal standards. Next, the strategy is principled because it provides the UN with an opportunity to increase multilateralism while contributing to overall regional stability. And by removing North Korea's nuclear, chemical, and biological capabilities, we are offered a permanent solution that neutralizes both the current threats and eliminates future ones. Lastly, this proposal is the most humane because it directly targets the refugee crisis within the rogue state while significantly decreasing the number of displaced refugees flowing out of the Asia region from states such as South Korea and Japan. And by containing the threat within the state itself, the number of both civilian and military casualties will fall in a more profound manner. Belgium's specific interests also follow the line of cognizance, adherence, principles, and humaneness. The policy practices multilateral cooperation and decreases unipolarity, it provides an opportunity for transitional justice. It ensures a return to international peace and security in addition to preventing the destabilization of Europe by a North Korean agenda. It also creates an avenue to remove the potential threat of further destabilization, both regionally and globally. 
The relevant laws that I have referred to throughout this presentation are listed on the left and include Article 51, the right to self-defense, preemptive and preventive self-defense, and the law of proportionality. It also includes treaties such as UNCLOS, the ICC, the European Union, and NATO. Lastly, the policy offers practicality through compliance. Damage control provides an alternative to warfare, is achievable through cooperative actions, presents an option for South Korea to absorb the state if the regime steps down and the state subsequently collapses, secures justice through the International Criminal Court, resolves the ongoing crisis, and prevents a reoccurrence. Realistically, the forecast is not all positive, but does present the best possible outcome in this situation. The strategy proposed is adaptable and achievable, but it will prove to be difficult. It's going to replace the humanitarian crisis with a financial burden and will require a long period of time that has slow progress and development, but this is over temporary unsustainable action the length of time it takes to redevelop this state will save lives. It will create a novel president and that will pertain to similar issues and set a more positive tone for the future as well as a more active tone for the United Nations. Finally, it is important that the international community and the United Nations Security Council remain resilient and remain vigilant, even if the outcome is entirely positive. We should incorporate as much transitional justice as possible and make use of the International Criminal Court to provide, promote, and protect. Absolutely reinvest in multilateral institutions, build greater unity, cooperate in a more stable, sustainable way in order to build a more formidable United Nations that promotes a real consensus among its member states. Thank you for following along.